Hello everyone, my name is Alan Kunner, and it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Nicholas Giuliano, who's the leading, who's working on, or leading research on the Making African Connections Project. And I'll just talk about that in a moment, but what I'd like to say is that, you know, this is the last in a series of lectures and talks that we've done from Newham Sixth Form College in East London uh, on the theme of African Studies. And um, this talk I know is, uh, I first met Nicola a couple of years ago now and ended up talking about uh, Sudanese objects that are artifacts from the Mahadia period that are in uh, British collections and museums. Very nearby the college, we have two roads that have you know, Sudanese connection, Khartoum Road and Dongola Road. Dongola Road has always fascinated me because it's very near where my father uh, was born. And I think the other thing is when I see a Dongola Road in Britain, I think, well, you know, that's so interesting because it's such a uh, kind of an obscure part of Sudan. So there must be a connection there with the kind of battle that took place because there's about a Dongola, I think that took place in 1898. So, um, Nicola will be talking about the MAP project, or the Making African Connections projects, and its relevance to reframing the debate and discussion around one African history and how it is perceived and understood in Britain, and two, in particular, kind of imperial connections to Africa and the way that in which objects, very often in kind of British military museums, are presented to uh, the public or have been presented. So the project is really trying to kind of reframe the way those objects are presented and understood and then perceived by the public. So Nicola, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. Very pleased to, to, to have the opportunity to, to talk about our work. Okay, fantastic. Um, and we're so pleased and honoured to have you here. Um, so um, like I'm going to ask a series of questions, you know, kind of on behalf of the audience. If people want to put questions in the chat, please do. We're, and then we can, as they go along, we will, if they match some of the questions I've got, I'll, 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 I'll say, well, this has been asked by you. And then there'll also be time at the end for um, us to field those questions to Nicola. So, Nicola, my first question is, so can you tell us a bit more about the background of the MAC project? Sure. So I work at the University of Sussex and the project's full title is um, Making African Connections, Decolonial Futures for Colonial Collections. And the starting point for the project really was that smaller museums in Kent and Sussex in particular has collections that were that are of very notable historical significance um, from Africa. Colonial period African collections that are of demonstrable historical significance. Um, and because they're in these smaller museums, uh, they, they haven't received the research attention or other kinds of attention that some of the, uh, some of the bigger national museums or the museums in, in the major metropolitan areas of the UK have received. Um, and we felt that the um, that these collections really deserve to be looking at. And we began doing preliminary research around a whole range of different kinds of museums uh, in, in the southeast of England. And we, we picked three case studies where we felt that the, the, that the collections were really of, of, of great historical interest. Um, and one of those is a Botswana collection, which is held at Brighton Museum. And another one is a collection from the Angola and Namibia borderlands, which is held uh, at the Powell Cotton Museum in Kent. And the third and final one, which is what I'm going to be talking about tonight, is um, the Sudanese material from the end of the 19th century, which is at the Royal Engineers Museum in also in Kent. Um, and I've literally just come from there. I've just got off the train and rushed home uh, to be here because we had a we had a Sudanese group visit the uh, Sudanese community group from Brighton visit the visit the visit the exhibition today, which was which was really exciting. 
Um, so we have those three case studies and then around those three case studies, we've built teams of specialists. Um, I'm probably the only person that works across the, all the teams, um, which were made up of subject specialists, uh, members of the diaspora in each case, and also um, colleagues and academics in, in, in the African countries. And um, uh, late in a minute, hopefully, um, I, I will play a video so that you can hear the rest of the Sudanese team talking. Um, unfortunately, they weren't able to join us this evening, which is, which is a shame. So, you, But uh, you will get to hear them talking through the video. Okay, um, that's very interesting. So, um, why, why, uh, obviously you're based at the University of Sussex, but why, why might there be such a concentration of objects? You know, there might be other parts of the country I've seen these material in the obscurely in the Museum of Lincoln July. Yeah. It holds the collection of the Lincolnshire Regiment that were involved partly in the Battle of Omdurman or Karari, as it's known by the Sudanese. So um why Kent and Sussex? Why why do you think there's such a concentration of these objects from you know that era of British history, African history in uh, those two counties? So when, when we began the preliminary research, the idea was based around some scholarship that's actually been done around Brighton. Um, and Claire Wintle, for example, has written about this, that Brighton Museum has a particularly strong collection because um, a lot of colonial officials and other, other kinds of uh, military officials and so forth retired to the South Coast. And then upon their retirement or possibly upon their death by descendants this material was given to the local museum so there was, there was this idea that along the south coast and in the southeast that there is this kind of concentration of material i'm not actually sure that's true because i think actually if you did similar work in other parts of the country you may well start finding that actually that this stuff is everywhere like you say it's in lincolnshire um, I'm currently in a freelance capacity also doing work for Ipswich Museum and they, their maritime history means that they have links to the empire but I think possibly if you started looking into it you'd find that pretty much everywhere in the country had had had, had something and that's and I think that's really important um, and another really important motivation for the project is to explore how how embedded empire was um, in, in British history and across the country, and also to start having the kind of to start having debates about what these objects mean, about what the future of these objects should be, whether they should stay in in the UK, whether they should be on display. Uh, we felt it was really important to have those discussions everywhere, and not and not just again in the major in the major cities, um, which have been the focus of, of these debates so far. Um, and, I, and I think actually the, the wealth of material that's across the country is a real sign of, of, of how um, how central empire is to, is, to, is to the UK as it exists today. Um, and I think it's to talk about Sudanese material specifically, there's an enormous amount of Sudanese material from this very specific period across the UK. Um, we, had a, we had one of our students do a little bit of work around the jibber um, which is a tunic that was worn by the Ansar, the followers um, of the Mahdi, and at, around how many of these were in the UK, and she found over 80. And we, do, we, don't, we don't believe our list is exhaustive. And that, again, ranges from military museums, as you've mentioned earlier, um, to local museums. There's one in Bexhill on Sea Museum, for example, um, where, you wouldn't, where you might be surprised to see it. And again, I think that that's a, that's a, that's a reflection of the scale of collecting in this period. Yeah, it's kind of history that's in context and out of context. It's in context because people from who, who were from the home counties or moved to the home counties on retirement they have had these objects and they've got those kind of military connections. But it's out of context. I can imagine Jibber presented in Bexhill. I was only there a month ago. If I'd have known, I'd well. Probably the museum was closed to visitors, but I'll, I'll, I'll go there in the summer kind of thing. Um, the, the, they're presented as this object from this period. And one of the things that, you know, uh, 
I think we shared, or I've spoken to you about um, going to watch the film cartoon with Charlton Heston and uh, uh, Lawrence Olivier in the, the, the leading roles as Gordon and the Mardi, and uh, a film made in the kind of middle 1960s, about 1964, 65, full Technicolor, you know, let's retrace our imperial past. And then after that, you know, the Sudanese connection really in the country has just faded from memory. It only exists in kind of almost like two poems, Vita Lampardia and, uh, you know, The Torch of Life and um, the, um, and the, and, and the poem Fuzzy Fuzzy by um, yeah, Rajad Kipling. But it's kind of faded from a kind of folk memory. On the other folk memories, obviously, well, not obviously, but if people have seen it, the, um, the, the uh, um, Dad's Army, uh, Sergeant Jones talks about being with, uh, you know, Lord Kitchener, General Kitchener, and uh, fighting the Fuzzy Wuzzy and all this kind of thing. And the, the two writers of that base their ideas on old sergeants that they knew who had obviously been in the Sudanese war, this kind of thing, and gave their kind of like, this is how it was. Anyway, uh, the Royal Engineers Museum. Can you tell us a little bit about the connection there? I know it's massive, but tell us what that involves. So um, the Royal Engineers Museum is a military museum in Kent, and it's funded um, directly. It's funded partly by the Military of Defence and partly by the Corps of Engineers itself. It's a, it's a charity that the Corps supports um, through a, an, a day's pay scheme. Um, so it's very embedded in the Royal Engineers and it's actually on the site where the Royal Engineers do the engineering part of their training. So they do their general military training elsewhere, but they do they learn the engineering side of it on site. Um, and, that, and that's mainly what the site is, but there's also the museum on that site. And it, it's a sort of it's a red brick building and out the front there are a lot of um, tanks um, um, and artillery vehicles, as I'm told, they're not tanks, they're artillery vehicles, I apologise. Um, and, um, and because the Royal Engineers have this long 300 year history and because they were so important in, well, they're hugely important in a lot of UK military history because they are the engineers, they build the stuff, they make the roads, they make it possible for, um, other, other other armies to go in, other parts of the army to go in. They have a very, very significant role. Um, and they were at all of the major imperial battles. And as a result of that, their museum collection has material, extensive material from China, from India. And then in terms of Africa, they have um, Ashanti material from the Ashanti Wars, uh, material from the Anglo-Zulu Wars, um, what's the other big one? Uh, Ethiopia, Magdala, they have material from that. And again, that's where they, they were there building the roads that allowed the other soldiers in, um, among, other, among other things. So they have, the, they have these really large um, African collections, which are currently displayed. It's a very old gallery. It's 30 to 40 years old since it was developed. And I think it, it's, it, it's a very triumphalist account of British imperial history. Um, and the objects that are there are not really explained in any context of the people that made them or what they might have meant to them. They're very much there as kind of trophies. Yeah. I was, I was going to ask you, whether they, you know, and this is in a sense about my next question about the background of the Mahadir, if you would like to explain that for the audience. But one of the key things is, OK, what did the Royal Engineers particularly build in Sudan, which may be a neat kind of uh, intro to the next question, which is about, you know, um, you know, the background of the Sudanese wars. What, what did they actually, uh, what particular role did they actually play in Sudan? Yeah, I'm not sure actually what, what, what exactly they did in, in Sudan. After the Mardis Wars, they had quite a big role in building infrastructure in Sudan. And again, there is, that is documented at this museum, but we haven't had the chance to look at that material yet. During the actual Sudan Wars, I'm not sure exactly what the role of the engineers was. Well, I, I think one of the, the key things was that they built a railway that Kitchener had used to come in 
to the country, just for the audience, um, when Nicola explains a little bit about them, Mahdia, the Sudan at that, you know, is still a massive country. And the northern Sudan is probably, you know, uh, well, Sudan at one point was the largest country in Africa, about a million miles square. If we take away the southern part of it, you're still left with a massive chunk of land, much of which is desert apart from the, the strip around the Nile. And so um, armies were, famously Hicks Pasha's army was annihilated in the western desert of Sudan. And so Kitchener's, Kitchener's strategy was to build a railway into the Sudan to carry the army and fight battles at the railhead. But Nicola, if you tell us a little bit more about the Mahdi and his significance yeah. to the Sudan. Yeah, of course, the train. I should have thought of the train. I was, I was, I, I, my colleague Fergus was talking about the train just this afternoon uh, 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 yeah. and the role of the train. But um, so I'm going to I'm, I'm going to give just quite a brief background to what is actually an immensely complicated <laughs> history. Um, and, and Alan, please do jump in, because I know I know I know, you, I know this is you're hugely well versed in, in this in this, too. So do, so, yeah. so, so do jump in or correct me if I if I, if I go wrong. But the um, the broad outline is that in 1881, Mohammed Ahmed Abdallah, who was a Sufi uh, leader, uh, mm -hmm declared himself the Mahdi, or Mahdi al-Muntaza, which um, means the rightly guided one and the expected one. So, so, so he, he, the, the arrival of the Mahdi is prophesied. Um, and there, there are other people who have also claimed, them, claimed, claimed this position for themselves in, in history. Um, uh, it, so he did that in, 18, in 1881, and he began to gather followers um, who, who were referred to as Ansar, um, and he launched uh, Japan, uh, a jihad against the Egyptian Ottoman occupiers of Sudan. So Sudan was under the control of, of, of the Ottoman Empire, which was ruling it through Egypt, which was also part of the Ottoman Empire, which makes it complicated. I know, it does make it very complicated to think of what is going on in Sudan. Yeah. Uh, it's commonly known in Sudanese history as the period of the Turkey. So the period of the Turkey, of the exactly. But it was a Turkish... Uh, administration that then took it upon itself to invade Sudan in uh, 1822 to claim the Sudan as part of the Egyptian Empire, but also as a bid to break away from the Ottoman Empire as well. Now, yeah. because now you would control a very big population uh, or big, very big territory, and you know you'd have slaves for your army and gold. The, the much um, you know. Um, prophesized gold that they would find in Sudan. So this would pay for this kind of Egyptian administration and empire. Can, please continue. Yes. Um, so yeah, so, so they've been under, under Turkish rule for about 60, or what they call Turkish rule, but it's actually Egyptian Ottoman rule, for about 60 years. So by 1885, so really remarkably quickly, he, he, he has taken control of what we broadly speaking, what we would recognize as Sudan. And, um, and this is an extraordinary achievement in a lot, in a lot of ways. And he, um, what was I gonna say? Yeah, so, 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 so he, he'd seized power and, and in order to do it, he'd, he'd managed to unify, not everybody was keen, but he'd managed to unify quite a large number of quite disparate Sudanese communities in order to do this. Hmm. Um, uh, uh, and in particular, he felt that the 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 the, the Turkia was corrupt. It was a corrupt form of Islam that that, that 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 they were ruling by, and also they wanted independence. So it's an it's an it's an African leader taking independence from from, yeah. from internal from from external occupier. If I just say something for the audience as well, what the Mali was very successful at. If you imagine the the River Nile. His movement began there. He then went to the western part of Sudan, to quite a remote area. And when uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Egyptians sent an army led by a British general, um, General Hicks, Hicks Pasha, all the art, all the art military leaders have the, um, the, you know, the, the name Pasha appended to them, or the title Pasha, which means sir. Uh, he then 
once that army was defeated, he effectively divided Sudan east to west, controlled the west, and then marched back east to uh, the center of power, which is in Khartoum, okay, which is where the two Niles, the blue and the white Nile, meet. So it effectively cut the country in half and ruled the western part and then could surround Khartoum and, uh, you know, uh, you're going to explain what happened then. <laughs> As you say, he took power. He took power and he, um, so General Gordon, who was a British figure, but was not there working on behalf of the British government. He was there working for, 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 for the uh, Turco Ottoman, the Ottoman Egyptian government, um, getting, trying to get people out, allegedly. Yeah. So, but, in the takeover of Khartoum, General Gordon was killed, and this became uh, this was a huge blow to the British. Even though he wasn't there as part of the British army, but it was a huge blow to the British to be defeated in this ex this sort of extremely clear and spectacular manner by by by, by an African leader. That 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 was that was quite shocking to to, to the imperial to the imperial mindset. Um, so, following Gordon's death. Um, the, the Mahdi himself dies quite soon after that of of of, of uh, natural of, of disease. I, I'm not sure we know exactly what, yeah. but he, he died, uh, and uh, and a Khalifa Abdullahi took over. Hmm. Four years later, some years later, in 1898, the British invade um, Sudan under Lord Kitchener. And there are a series of um, extremely one-sided battles of extremely large number of Sudanese people are killed. Um, and it culminates at the end of 1898 in, in the massacre at Omdurman. Yeah. Um, after, the, after the massacre, um, the, the, the tomb of the Mahdi is destroyed. Um, he, he, the place where he is buried, and the, the, te the tomb that's built around that is, is destroyed. His body is disinterred, his head removed and paraded. And this is very much seen as revenge for Gordon. Yeah. What happened to Gordon, who, who also had his head removed. Yeah. So, um, and, I, and I, yeah, so I mentioned the tomb specifically because that, that parts of that tomb are now, um, are now in this museum in Kent. So that was one of the reasons yeah. why, why why we thought this museum was it was really important to talk, to talk about this museum. I mean, I'll just mention something for the audience that um, you, you, some may not be aware that um, Nicola mentioned earlier on when you talk about Sufism. Well, Sufism, you know, the Sufi sects, religious sects of Islam uh, are really built around the veneration of saints. Okay, so rather than just only the Prophet Muhammad, there are also individual saints, holy men who people follow. So Muhammad Ahmed, the Mahdi, um, he was someone who was venerated by his people and therefore was had a tomb built in his honour where people could go and obviously, you know, do their prayers and not worship the tomb, as it were, but worship at the tomb of the Mahdi, because uh, he was seen as this uh, redeeming and saint-like figure and worthy of veneration. If you go in northern Sudan, you'll find a lot of those sort of tombs around, uh, much smaller than the Mahdi's, but, you know, still some very sizable buildings as well, okay? And I think that was one of the reasons why, in a sense, the British actually blew the, the tomb up, because yeah. it wouldn't be a place of veneration and sainthood so yeah. okay um, yes and because you're then venerating somebody who who, who overthrew an invading army yeah. um you you be, th th there's a concern that the grave will become a, a sort of collecting point for dissent against the british presence that that, that that's where rebellion will will kind of coalesce so yeah, yeah it's a deliberate and also, and also, going back to one of your previous points one of the key things here is that there's a debate really is it really about the revenge for Gordon or as it's popularly perceived, or is it really the, the invasion of uh, Sudan, Britain was controlling Egypt, a way of guarding 
the waters of the Nile because the French French army were very interested in you know um, being in that territory to disturb British rule. Yeah, and I think Lord Cromer, who was the in effect the Governor General of uh, um, Egypt, and at one point was on record as saying the Mahdists are as good a candidate as any for keeping the bed warm because. There is this kind of 14 year gap between the death of Gordon and the final overthrow of the Mahdi state. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I think the other thing, um, but 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 I think the way it's sold to the British public mm. as an action is it, it, it is very clearly as revenge for Gordon. But yes, there's yeah. a lot of other things going on, and there's a lot of complicated historical debate around exactly why then and and why. They did that, but I think it was sold to the British public as revenge for Gordon, and I think it was sold partially to to, to some of the, the soldiers as that as well. Yeah, there's a lot of propaganda around it. Massive, yeah. Okay, I, okay. I think you're going to show us a video. Yes, yeah, so I, I'm going to play a video now of my. Well, they'll introduce themselves, but these are my colleagues who are working on the project. Um, who are working on the project with me and who unfortunately can't be with us today. Let me just do share screen, sorry. There we go. Okay. 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 I am Reem Al Hilo, Reem Musa Yabu, Al Khalifa Ali Al Hilo. I'm the fourth of the fifth generation who have been living in Al Durman. Since 1884 or 85, my ancestor Khalifa Ali al was the second Khalifa of Al Imam Al Mahdi. As you all know, that Al Mahdi has had main three Khalifas: Khalifa Abdullah, the first one who ruled actually after the Mahdi's death; uh, Khalifa Ali al was the second man, and the Khalifa Sharif. So I am descendant of all these four men from both sides: my mother and my father. I started as well an NGO in the rehabilitation of the sites of the Mahdiya all along Sudan. Thank you very much. My name is Osman Nasseri. I have interest in the Mahdiya as a student of modern Sudanese history. As a matter of fact, where I come from, Lufa'a, suffered at the hands of Mahdism and the legacy we had is presenting Mahadiya as a form of repression which the tribe was not particularly happy about. This involvement now in decolonizing the production of the Mahadiya in museums and Western mind it will help us understand that experience. It is interesting that Mahadiya was the first serious involvement in modern Sudanese history with the European world. And as such, it is important to see how that reaction evolved and what results it came out with. Okay, thank you both very much. Um, I'll introduce myself very briefly as well. My name is Fergus Nicol. I'm a broadcaster and historian, and I've been studying the Mahdiya period since about, well, the late 1990s, but mostly I've written about the... 1880s and 1890s, with uh, an occasional foray into the neo Mahdiya period in Sudan in the early 20th century. So let's talk, please, about the exhibition that currently exists in Gillingham at the Royal Engineers Museum. Reem, what did you think when you first went to Gillingham to see what was on display there? Actually, I thought the display reflects, yani, as we know, all the glorifying in the British and the colony period. Uh, and I think there is a misconcept even for the I, I it happened that I was there looking in the in the in the, the collection and there was a group with a tourist guide. And what, when he was speaking about uh, Gordon and when he was in Khartoum and how he had died, many of the things that he mentioned were not all true. I have been listening and he looked at me and he was very embarrassed. So he quickly went away with his group. And on my way out, he was at the reception. He waited for me 
and he asked me poli politely, uh, are you with the project of the decolonizing that, that about Sudan? I said, yes. He said, I am sorry. I know that I have said things that were not all true when I was the, uh, with the group. But I am sorry, this all the, the this only I knew about. It. Can I meet you when you come back next time, when you visit next time too? I have many questions. So I said, of course, I will be, I will be delighted to sit with you and uh, talk and answer to all the questions that I have the answers. So it shows that they have, you know, that lack of correct knowledge, you know, of this period. And even the, the labels, the labels were not, I believe that relabeling is very, very, really to call the, the items really by the names and the right description. What did you think, given the family background that you described, what did you think when you saw those items from your history, uh, the part of the kubba, wow. the part of the flag? Yeah. We don't have as much items here, definitely. And um, they call them, you know, the people of the museum, they were correctly to call them more loots. I was very moved, definitely. You know, very, because in our family, the, the Mahdi is, is regarded as something very high, you know, it uh, has that concept still, and it's something still going on with the, all the pluses and the minuses, but the, the answer, they still exist. The belief in the, the Dawla, the, the state has gone, but the, uh, the Risala, the mission is still there. The thing is still alive, and I mean, I, I grew up within with two grand, I have a personal <laughs> contact because I grew up uh, within my two grandmothers who have heard from their, uh, the people who has um, survived during the Mahdiya. It has a very spiritual presence. And when you see the items, when you see the jibba, for example, with blood and the flags, we have heard all the stories about them, you know, especially in the Shaitan, in Ajit in the Jazeera Abbas battle and this, for us it reflects the heroism of these ordinary people who came from nowhere, who have fought at the time the greatest power in the world. It's a source of pride. Yeah. It's definitely a source of pride, yeah. So Osman, tell us about your reaction when you first saw the collection, when you first saw the way it was displayed. What did you think? This is a war museum. And obviously, the collection and display is limited. But obviously, what one lacks is evidence of the living, not of the dead. And I would like to have seen war presented not as a glorious experience, but as a sorry, sad thing, not to be particularly proud of. I would have liked to see more of ordinary people. I want to see real people. There's no feeling that we are about anything except presenting figures, meant to be national figures, and ignoring ordinary men, even in a situation where there's nothing to be particularly very proud of. I see the new tendencies now in creating history in a context of an apology, rather of celebration, of killing. I'm still grateful that evidence of history in whatsoever form is preserved and it is made accessible for people to see, which might not be the case in some third world countries where history is destroyed and not looked after in any way. So when it comes to representing a decolonized version of the Sudan experience or the experience of the British in Sudan, how can we do it better? What should we be looking at that gives us, as you said, a sense of the living, not just those who died on the battlefield? I would probably like to see British perspective, which is against the war, or as well the practice and methods of the British army in a place like Sudan. There was a lot of criticism about the way the Ottoman war was handled, how prisoners of war were physically liquidated. There are even debates 
to Parliament and elsewhere about how the war was conducted, perhaps not in the best form to expect a war to be handled. Just the other week, I got names of two Irish politicians who were almost celebrating the Mahdi and feeling very, very proud of the Mahdi's achievements. I would like to look more into what, what, what these Irish Republicans perhaps were all about. But it seems that there were voices here which were critical of the experience. I, I, surely that might help. Even uh, a name like Gordon to be put in a, a context which explains that was criticized for being very near to slave traders. If that is highlighted, um, people were reminded how the anti-slavery society treated him, perhaps he would be treated less than a saint. Yes, that's fascinating. Reem, can I ask you the same question? And I wonder whether when we change an exhibition or we look at it in a new light, is it more important to take existing items from the conflict and explain them correctly and accurately? Or should we be looking at more material that tells us about life in Sudan, Sudan about women, about families, about religion and society? Yeah, actually, <laughs> uh, this this special question we have been uh, dealing with at the Khalifa's House Museum, because the Mahdiya was not only war; it was people, it was a building society, it was women, it was cooking, it was uh, dressing, it was other things than war and killing. So uh, it is a war museum. So can we change the concept of the museum? Is the the museum concept? You know. So uh, we have to respect it first, but we have to do as much better to try to decolonize and to give this in, uh, Sudanese insight of the, what they have, of, the, of their collection, and in respect. So, you know, we try to um, uh, amalgamate between the two, you know. We have to respect their uh, concept, of course, and we have to put in our uh, side of the story, our, our side of the, uh, the flavor, the Sudanese flavor, but definitely, 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 we need to reflect the Mahdiya as not an only an enemy. It is has been, it is a it has it is a society. It is a liberation uh, liberation uh, movement at that time, and it has succeeded in the Arab world, in the African world. I think it's something glorious we have really to reflect it. You know. Let me ask you one final question each. Did you see something really remarkable? Can I ask you what was your favorite item in the display or the thing that made you think, wow, I didn't believe I'd see that? Banners are what struck me because there are so many aspects in what a banner can say to us from the fabric to the style of writing to the material used in writing. And I thought that reflects very interesting efforts behind it. Actually, two things. Two things, banners as well, because we, we spent a lot of time discussing and, and interpreting uh, them. They were very, very interesting and very be, uh, wide, wide um, uh, uh, messages and a uh, lot of things said in them. And of course, the, uh, the head of the tomb of the Mahdi, the original one, that was captivating. For me, it was captivating. I'm back. You're back. Yeah, um, that was fantastic. So, um, with Reem and Osman, to Sudanese people living in Britain with widely different perspectives on the Mahadia, Reem mm -hmm. is obviously her, her forebear was Ali Hillen, one of the major caliphs and generals of the Mahdi army, the Mahdi's army, and. Uh, Osman has said he's from Rafah, which is a, a small town on the Nile, Blue Nile, who 
So he said, suffered at the hands of the Mahadiya, you know, because there's taxation and all these sort of things that went on at that period of time. How are you going to pay for a standing army? And so on and so forth. And do you support that? Um, widely different perspectives, but in, in effect, they're both very interested in that period. That period, they're very interested in these objects being created uh, by the Sudanese people there. Um, how have we, how, what have you tried to do to make their ideas, in a sense, into a reality about relabeling, representing the history of the Sudan at that period? Uh, could, could I share my screen again to just show some images? Of, oh, would that be... Please do. Let's get the other screen up. So, oh, yeah. So just to say that, that this, this is the, the Kuba um, that, that you were talking about earlier, um, Alan. Um, mm -hmm. This is on display in the museum. Um, it's it stayed where it is in the permanent gallery because we can't actually move it. They appear to have built the case around it. And mm -hmm. then on the left, you see the photographs again in the museum of, of it um, when it was being, the black and white photograph from the time when it, when it was being destroyed. Um, and then the, 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 the contemporary rebuilt one, um, which was photographed when Fergus, Osman and Reem were all in Sudan just before COVID hit, they were, able, they were, they were all there. So- um, That was rebuilt really yeah. during the Second World War uh, in the 1940s, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so, 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 so that's, ooh. oh, that's for you, Alan, I'll just share that later, but, um, mm -hmm. So the, this this was the previous display. Uh, this is still the still the display. Um, um, that's what the museum looks like. These are our posters. We've tried to do everything in in Arabic as well. Um, and the temporary display is on until the end of the year, so it's on until Christmas. So plenty of time to go and see it. But I just want to show some images of the display. We've tried to include, because the museum does have things in its collection that aren't, um, that, that, that are, that don't relate specifically to battle. So you see on the, on the right here, you see that's a food bowl. So we've tried to talk about the making of food uh, and who would have been making that food um, because the Mahdi did also have slaves. So, so that's an important thing to think, thing to acknowledge. And as you say, not everyone Who's working on the project um, is, 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 is a fan of the Mardi. Um, also musical instruments, there's quite a lot of musical instruments so we've talked about that. We've tried to talk about when it comes to the jibbers, their symbolism, um, wh why they were important, why they were worn, um, how they developed but also we've tried to talk about how they were made, um, the spinning of cotton and, and, and again the, the role the role of women in that um, we are limited as as as, as Riemann Osman said in terms of what the collection is and what we have um, but we we have tried and then we've also tried to to explain the history more more accurately than the, the, than it was portrayed before um, and more fairly um, in 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 a more balanced way. Um, so it's, it, 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 it is quite a small exhibition. Um, um, so we've, 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 we've done what we, we can. Okay, yeah. But I can see that you've taken those out of that, in a sense, military context and sort of redisplayed those objects in a way that lets understand the object. So just for the audience, one of the key things is, as you mentioned, the jibba. And if you could show us maybe that picture of the jibba that you have, yeah, this one. Can you explain why these have so much significance uh, for the Mahdi's period, for the Mahdi's followers, the Ansar? So, yeah, so the museum has about eight of these, which is quite a lot. And they, this, this is a sort of, uh, this is a relatively simple one. They have um, they have some which are, which are even even more simple than this, and they have some which are um, this is probably mid mid range, um, some that are, are significantly more elaborate um, in, in, in terms of the decoration. And the the um, 
The jibba is based on an earlier garment that was worn by um, by by Sufi or Sufis in Sudan to, to to signify their sort of asceticism, that their lack of interest in in the um, uh, their interest in higher things, that their their that that their mind was on higher things rather than worldly goods, worldly possessions, and those garments would have been genuinely quite ragged and patched multiple times. Um, there are very few few of those in UK museum collections or European museum collections. They're extremely rare. There's one in the British Museum, and there's one. Um, I'm trying to remember if it's Germany or Belgium. There's another one. So there are they are around, but there aren't lots of them. Jibbers, as I said, there are at least 80 in the country, probably more. Um, so obviously by this stage, the patches have become a decoration. And the and the, 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 the jibbers that I'm showing you all come from that much later 1890 period. Um, again, most of the stuff in UK museums comes from that period rather, for, rather than from the earlier um, um, battle rather than when uh, the Mahdi took over the country, um, because that's when that's when a lot of British soldiers were on the ground collecting material. Um, and uh, collecting was huge and extensive. So the patches re re reflect those garments and the asceticism. There's also a sense that the Mahdi was trying to create um, a unified force so that everybody wore the jibber rather than people wearing things that differentiated where they were from um, or, 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 or their wealth or other aspects of their life. As time goes on, the jib has become finer and finer and more and more, it appears, and more and more decorated. And by, by 1898, some of them clearly seem to be showing rank. There are some extremely elaborate ones with, with gold um, brocading that appears to have been taken from Egyptian uniforms, for example, um, um, de decorating them. The, this one doesn't have pockets. Usually they have pockets on the left above the, sort of roughly above the heart. They're, they're, they're the same back and front, so they can be worn either way. And the pockets would normally hold um, an amulet. Um, and again, amulets can, can, can um, I don't have an image of an amulet for you, but again, amulets are often, Sudanese amulets are quite common in uh, UK museum collections again. Um, uh, and, I, I, and I think that so the objects kind of tell us a lot about we present the, the we've we've created leaflets with all this information and with the history of the jibber and how it developed and how it reflects the Mahdi's ideas and, and, and uh, military aims as well um, in the hope that providing this kind of contextual information about what it actually meant to the Sudanese people who made and wore it. Um, counterbalances to some extent some of the um, British narrative which dominates within the museum. Yeah, I mean, just for the audience, Sudanese men would still wear a garment like this, but it would be plain white. You might find in a range of colours. Uh, when I was teaching in the Sudan in the 80s, one of my uh, colleagues at the school, Ustaz Musa, actually wore it was a jalebi that he curiously had a pocket on the back. On the shoulder blade, and I said, "What is? Why have you got that pocket there?" And he said, "Well, I'm a, I'm from Shendi. He was a what they call a shagia, uh, and he said that that's you know it's, I'm a follower of the Mahdi. Yeah, you know I'm one of the um, one of the Ansar. Yeah, so it's still very relevant still today in Sudan. Well, that was in the 80s, but I still expect to find those now." as a sort of stylized um, indication to people, yeah. I, I saw one today, in fact, some, one of, uh, I was at the museum today with, uh, with a group of people and somebody had one with, had brought one with them to show me, which was lovely. So exactly as you described. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Okay, um, I must admit, I really love looking at those. And obviously you've got that, that, that rather elaborate code. If just for the audience, you've seen that, um, the Crescent Moon and, uh, um, um, yeah, that that object that would have adorned the the uh, the conical of the the Mardi's tomb. Uh, 
Dream mentioned the Khalifa's house, which is next to the Khalifa Abdullah Taishi. And his significance is that he was from uh, Darfur in the west of Sudan. So he was a way, you know, embodiment of that unity of the people of the Sudan. So bringing tribes from the west to actually govern in the river tribes of the like, central Sudan. Okay. Um, the last few questions, really. I will say to the, the audience, we'll maybe overrun a little bit, but I'll just say, well, talk's ended, but Nicola's just going to carry on, not, not take any questions. So um, I think we've covered a lot of how the material came to the museum. We can just say one thing. Uh, some of this was actually gathered on the battlefield and also house-to-house -house searches as well uh, in On Demand, which was the, the Mardi's capital, wasn't that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So a lot, a lot of it has come um, directly from battlefields. Um, some of it is, was kind of officially collected, and some of it, it was souvenirs um, taken off battlefields by soldiers, and then later given to the museum, either by the sol ordinary soldiers themselves, or by their descendants. So that's why there's so much of this stuff around that it's kind of still, it's probably still quite a bit of it in private hands that we don't know about. Um, mm. Um, and I think as well, it, it, I, not the images I've shown tonight, but but a number a number of the things, the gibbers in particular, um, are stained stained with blood, um, and, and and these things very clearly come from come come from 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 a context of of violence. Um, so they, they they have that, they're torn, they're damaged, um, and sometimes they, ha they 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 have blood, what appears to be blood on them. So yeah, that is how yeah. it. Okay, um, one of the things in the audience, you know, the Battle of Omdurman, the use of uh, machine guns, the Gatling gun, ten, they estimate around 10,000 Sudanese men were actually, 10,000 Sudanese were actually killed at that battle. It was one of these classic battles where, you know, uh, technology, Western technology over a rush, on rushing board, I mean, Interestingly, I don't think Britain learned its own lesson because in 1914 to 18, they, they tried the exact same tactics of the, the Mahdi's army of, of rushing, of rushing machine guns. You know, my grandfather was a sergeant in the Royal West Surrey, so he led many of those charges across various battlefields. Survived right into the last month of the war when he was injured. Okay. Mm. So we've learned about how the material came. You told me an interesting story the other day about people actually having this on sale, maybe in the market in Khartoum as well, in some of these sort of types of objects in the period of time. And the flags would, I think, have been interpreted by the army as, you know, the battle honours of the other army, so they would be worthy of collection and displaying. Yeah. So. Yeah. One of the final questions is about the cause for repatriation. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So, um, so repatriation is obviously quite a hot topic in museums at the moment, um, particularly in relation to colonial material from Africa. Um, and there have been no official calls from the Sudanese government for, for the return of any of these items, including think things like the Kuba. Um, and there may well be uh, political reasons in Sudan for that. Um, whereas obviously from countries like Ethiopia um, and Nigeria, most noted, those two most notably, but other countries as well, there have been calls um, for, for, for the return of, of, of items taken during this, uh, taken under extreme violence during the colonial period. That kind of speaks to that idea of, you know, mildism being contested in Sudan and the idea of it being a political movement, you know, because of the, the Umma party, which is the party sponsored by the Mahdi's uh, descendants, really, their family, that uh, is a major political force in the Sudan, particularly in the post-war exactly. war era. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and one of the things that Reem was talking about, the Khalifa's House Museum, which, as you said, was near, near the tomb, which we showed, um, 
that, 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 that's been renovated. There's been a lot of money spent. There's a great curator there. You can see an interview with her on uh, Ikles Ilias, she's called. You can see an interview with her on our Making African Connections website, where mm -hmm. you can also see the video I showed if you wish to watch it again. You can see all the objects. You can see information about the exhibition, all kinds of things on there. So do have a look if, if you're interested um, and contact us. So if you want as well, you're very welcome. Mm -hmm. um, so... I've I've lost my thread. So yes, yeah, so there's so so there's been a lot of a lot of money's gone into that. I think it's UNESCO money. I'm not sure um, has have gone into the redevelopment of that. So there is so there is, and this is one of the things that Reem works on. She's interested in making sure that that heritage is is preserved. And as you said, obviously she has very specific family reasons for doing that, um, uh, uh, as well as other historical reasons. Mm -hmm. But but I think I think um, we were talking today at the exhibition about this issue, and, and there was a, f a feeling among the group that although they wouldn't necessarily want things to go back right now, um, with under the present circumstances, mm -hmm. that, 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 that in the future that some of this stuff should go back, um, mm -hmm. and that it's I think as well where, when the UK has a lot of this material. Um, and it's not particularly well understood in the UK. And the country that made the material doesn't necessarily have it for whatever reason. If they want it back. I, I think that that should be considered, but it's not, it wouldn't be my call to make. We should be very clear about that. It's not my call in any way. Yeah. But um, in the meantime, I think we need to find ways to work together on these collections. Um, um, uh, uh, and we're hoping to pursue that um, initially through a meeting with some curators in Sudan. We're trying to digitize them and make them as publicly accessible as possible, although obviously digitizing, not everyone has access to the internet. Yeah. So, you know, that's I mean, just... Yeah, one of the interesting questions, that, uh, one of the interesting points I think raised by Reem was um, about, you know, like her family connection. Um, and it's kind of, significance of the way things are displayed and also her interaction with one of the museum guides who said I know what I'm saying is not correct but I'm still gonna you know I've yeah. got yeah. job to say it you know um, it, it, it's very interesting because the, the book the Mardi State of Sudan was by Dr Peter Holt was published in 1952 and that looks at the Mardi State not at it, of imperial conquest, but just how it actually worked and explains Mardism extremely well. That's been in the public domain for 70 years, but you know, people just haven't caught up with it. You know, you know, yeah. the, that kind of mythologizing of the Mahdi here still exists. Yeah. Still persists, really. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I and I think that's one of the things that um, the Osman always says. He says it's not about necessarily about telling a Sudanese point of view. There's a load of British scholarship on this that that, that just says that what you're saying is not right. So, yes. um, you know, it's not it's not even a question of, of always of, of a Sudanese perspective. It's it, it, it's of accurate history and and good history and, and thorough history, which I know is a subject close close to both our hearts. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's, it's taking African history seriously, you know, like his yeah, like how yeah. it functioned, you know, how did it work, so on and so forth, good and bad, let's have it all out there. You know, I mean, the, there's a history of slavery in my own family in the northern Sudan, which I'll talk freely about, kind of thing. It needs to be spoken about um, for, to a kind of an honest conversation. Um, yeah, and I think to, to just follow up that that when Reem talks about about Chris, his name's Chris, um, and Chris uh, and Reem, um, they weren't able to meet because Reem is in Sudan, hmm. um, and and obviously cannot travel at the moment. But they have they we did they, we did do a Zoom call between the two of them where uh, which we recorded, um, and it should be on the website. But I've just noticed it's not, so I'll be investigating that and making sure that is available. Yeah. Um, where, where they actually talk about that and what he was saying, and and, and she 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 gives her perspective on a, on a lot of the objects and how she thinks they should be spoken about. And he is, as a result of that, will be talking about the the collection quite differently in the future. And it's a it's a really nice conversation, and I think it's quite brave of someone uh, to just hold their hands up and say, "I don't know, but I'm really open to yeah. to, to to finding out." Yeah. 
I know that Fergal have done, Fergal had um, Nickel there had done work with, I think it was Osman about reinterpreting the banners and showing, um, in, in a sense, what the prayers on them meant, who they might have been written by, you know, how the person was, so on and so forth. Really interesting in the, the Journal of the Sudan Southern Society of the United Kingdom. Finally, um, you know, you've got an online archive there. There's a few questions in the chat, which I'll go through. Um, so what is the role of the online ar ar archive of the project in the project? How important is that? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so I mentioned the online archive, and as I said, there's a, there's a lot of stuff on there. And um, we've been very committed to putting everything up there and trying to show our working progress, uh, our thinking where we've got things wrong, we say so. Um, um, and where, where we've rethought things, we, we'd say so. And what's on there is um, is the objects from all three museums that we're currently working with. And then also profiles of everybody working on the project. Events are on there, there'll be recordings. Um, as I said, that the recording I mentioned previously is on there. And the idea is that it's not all about the objects. So an object and a person have and an event all have an equal entry and everything is equally valid. And what we're trying to do is build up links around these collections. So all the all of the gibbers from the collection are linked to, for example, a piece of information which explains the development of the gibber and then also tells you where you can find other ones in the UK and also leads you to that bit of um, data that um, Elfie our student uh, assistant, a student research assistant worked on saying where the jibbers are in the UK um, uh, and, all, and, all, and all kinds of things. So it's kind of a repository for everything we've done, but it's also very much a research tool um, and it's an active thing. So if, if there are things people want to respond to on the website, um, they can do that, but they can do that by contacting us. And if they want things included on the website, we can look at doing that as well. Okay. It's been, quite, it's been quite a useful tool for thinking about um, connections between things. Yes. Well, and also I think that, you know, that's that idea of um, visiting museums, that we, we can bring things to life, because when we look at the objects, we, it would be nice to see them in, 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 in the flesh, as it were, in reality. But, you know, in the, the world of lockdown, we've all begun to look at, you know, we've always, for a number of years, looking at things online so it's really good that you've curated that and brought it together and then made those links which we can now do because yeah. so much of this information was obscured really which is I think one of the reasons why the kind of mythologizing and the, in, in a sense the poor labeling and understanding has persisted because it's just so fragmented really yeah yeah, yeah. in effect modernism and the and so it just turned into a kind of almost a musical joke by yes. you know, the dad's army depiction, you know. Yeah, I think it would be nice to get all the modest material in the UK uh, in one place on, online, but um, yeah, I don't know who's going to fund that. <laughs> so well, I'll contribute to that. Yeah, we can, we can, we can, start, we can start a fundraiser. Yeah, now I've had a question about Someone who is from May uh, Schumer, she's still in the chat. Now I'm going to ask you a question. So I am an MA public, uh, I am an MA public art and performance student who's graduating in September. Have you considered working with a public artist to create a new piece reflecting on the history of the collection of public art significantly significance in an attempt? to decolonize the collection. I'm really interested in your project as both an artist, interested in post-colonial studies and as a British Sudanese. Okay, welcome May, who is trying to locate my identity within both cultures. My email, I've, I've got your email here May, and what I'll do is I will pass that on to uh, Nicola if I may, and I'd yeah. love to have a conversation with you about how I might participate. Thank you. I think that's a really interesting idea about working with artists to reinterpret how Sudanese, like May, like myself, a mixed Sudanese heritage who 
would like, who interpret this kind of period, how, how we might react to it, yeah? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I think it. I think it's really interesting, and um, there are there are a lot of museums in the UK who have done, um, you know, who who do who do use artists to reinterpret their collection and and, and bring new perspectives and, and and address these really complex issues. That wasn't something we decided to do in the project. Um, um, I think because because our focus was elsewhere on getting these objects out and ass assessing what they were. In, in one of the other museums we're working with, we're working with some contemporary crafts people to, um, to, to commission some new objects responding to the historic objects. Um, but we have sought additional funding to do that. Um, so funding, funding would be the main issue. Um, funnily enough, it's something that Osman, who, who you saw earlier speaking on the film, um, ha has raised as, a, as something that he'd be interested in. So, um, I'd be really, uh, um, I'd be really happy to talk to May. Um, so please do pass on her contacts. But um, um, at the moment, there's no, there's no money in the budget for 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 for, 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 for additional work like that. But 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 I but I agree that that when those things are well judged, they can, they can be really they can be really enlightening. Okay, good. Now um, from Paul Lane, not so much asked a question, but actually. Uh, objects from the South Sudan, there was an exhibition a few years ago uh, from objects from the South in European museums. Now, Paul, what I'll do with that link um, and various other things we've been talking about on our African Studies website, we'll put those links there so people are in the chat and we get a lot of views of our African Studies um, lectures, uh, talks, um, online. So we'll put that prominently that people can view it. So the more people know about the very interesting history of the Sudan. You know, can, I, can, I, can, I just, can I just thank Paul Lane a lot for putting that, um, for, for, for putting that in the chat box for us because um, my friend Zoe Cormack runs that project. It's one of the people, one of the people that runs that project, and it is an absolutely fantastic project. So it's great to have somebody else say it, so that I'm not just shoehorning in my friend's project in a slightly, uh, slightly questionable yeah. manner. Um, I believe as well that the publication arising from that project is imminent. Um, so th that's a series of short, um, short essays. Uh, on, on all kinds of different uh, South Sudanese museum objects in the UK. And I would say that collections of South Sudan are quite different from Sudan because the Sudanese collections are very much focused on this 1890s mm. conflict, whereas South Sudanese material has a lot of it has come out of anthropological collection. Yeah. Um, and, uh, 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 so, so it's quite different and perhaps more varied than some of the students. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, no, great tip, great tip. Really pleased to have that mentioned. Yeah, I mean, Paul said, my pleasure, I had pleasure of being part of that project. Fantastic. <laughs> I mean, talking about South Sudan, you know, an area of uh, a kind of region which was almost like a, an anthropo anthropologist playground, really. I've got, you know, books about the nearby Evans Pritchard and the Azan. Yeah. I'm asking all sorts of things. Um, now, Nicola, there aren't any other questions, but that's been so wonderful. I know that the other day you said, would you mind if I bring you into the project, Alan? So have you got any questions to me before we wind that up? Uh, no, well, I, I, I was, I was, I was really, I, I'm really interested in the work that you're that that, that you're doing at NUVIC with, with the with the Africa Studies um, mm -hmm. program and and, and, and research work that's going on because actually one of the questions that I'm often asked when I go into museums um, and I work both for this project and I, and I do some freelance work as well and I, the question I'm always asked is that they're really keen to try and support learning in mm. schools um, and students of all ages right through young mm. children up to sixth form college and onwards um, and, 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 and kind of thinking about how they can do that and how they can um, better support the school curriculum and I think that's really um, yeah. um, really important um, so, so 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 I would just be curious if anyone had any kind of 
uh, thoughts or ideas about that, um, you, you might, may feel a bit put on the spot, so you don't have to answer straight away. But it's, it's okay. I can, I'll, I'll, but, but, but about how it. how all this material and all the different people working on it from different angles can can, can be brought together. Well, I think one of the key things is that we need to, you know, develop people's interest and knowledge in African history. You know, I think the sort of perception that, that there isn't anything there, that uh, it's, um, you know, not worthy of study. And so part of the object of the African Studies Project, because we, myself and my colleague Karina, who's listening in on the drive home here, um, was the idea rather that we would, you know, look at, um, we know, Dr. Tony Green from King's College has been really helpful with to us over the years by hosting talks and visits and all sorts of things. He was the historical advisor on OCR syllabus, African kingdoms, medieval African kingdoms, and um, a particular area of interest of his. So one of the things that we looked at was kind of running that syllabus. The syllabus as a way it doesn't really sort of like suit everything that we want to do. But what we're trying to do is like next year we will change our syllabus to, uh, or change the units that we teach to do one about Britain, colonization, decolonization, which will involve uh, Sudan, okay? And the other thing is to look at coursework based around the African kingdoms unit, okay? So one of the things there is to actually bring African history on the map. New Vic, oh, strangely, has a history of 17th century history. We must have 17th century history on our, you know, that was the original principles idea and that's been carried on uh, throughout and we like see that's tradition, but everything else has moved in that phase. But at the moment, I think, not even at the moment, I mean, African history has been, uh, a real interest of mine for many years, you know, since uh, you know, I was in my early 20s and the mid 80s. And, you know, going on, the we need to put clear messages because I think that colonial generation have died off and with them, in some ways, the interest in the study of that because colonial archives were opened up in the 80s and 90s. And it's kind of, uh, it's not died off, but with it, this is a time to really reinvigorate the study of African history, even if it's of the, you know, just of the colonial period. That's a starting point to look at the present and the past. Sudan was only governed by Britain for 54, 55 years, you know, 56 years, something like that. It's a, a very short period, but significant period in Sudanese history and the way that Sudan is perceived in Britain. And I just think that we, it's beholden on us to make a, and not just about that country, but all countries right across the con continent, the huge diversity, the range of how those countries have been governed by uh, Africans and um, Europeans, and to get a greater understanding. I mean, Sudan is a very interesting country because the northern Sudan, you know, where my father's from, you know, the idea of people perceiving themselves to be um, Arab, but, but, you know, I always would emphasize the African nature of the, the culture and um, of the people. My own family there, you know, the, the elder relatives will speak um, what they call Ratana, which are Nubian languages, that African man languages. That have nothing to do with Arabic, okay? Mm -hmm. My old, uh, my, my aunts and, um, you know, my, my dad, my father's sisters, generally many of them, a few of them never left really, really significantly, and that's what they spoke. They're actually Arabic, was quite limited, really. So they spoke the language, the ancient languages of the country, yeah? And, you know, that, that needs to be venerated, as I said before, History of slavery in my family. When you go there, there will be the, if you want, the Arab goodness and the African goodness. They meet in interesting ways. My father, he demanded that those, all of the family was brought together. And I was very proud of that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, it's a, a true understanding and, you know, making. As you said, a real 
connection with Africa. Yeah? Yeah. And we can only do that by a proper understanding of the history of okay. the objects and the peoples. Okay. Thank you for coming along this evening. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's been it's been great. Okay. And thanks for everyone for sticking with us. We ended up going 14 minutes over, but um, you know, I'm I hope that was worth listening to. There'll be more on the website and we'll uh, put some links to the, the things that you were talking about. Okay. Oh, May says thanks for a brilliant talk. Thank you, May, for your your praises there. Okay. Um, thank you very much. The video will be available soon of the of the of the webinar. Okay. Bye bye. Good evening to everyone. We'll see you. There'll be more talks next. Um, I think beginning in, in October. And of course, we will have Nicola back as a guest. <laughs> if what? <laughs> we'll have you back as a guest. <laughs> okay, excellent. All right, then. Thank That's you. Important. I hope we can be, meet in person. <laughs> okay, good stuff. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>